Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Permaculture is a portmanteau between two words, permaculture and agriculture. It was devised in the, um, well, by that fellow there, Mr. Bill Mollison. It's an Australian fellow, worked in the Tasmanian territories, doing research, and while he was in the bush, he was often struck by just how well nature seemed to work. Everything was provided for through the natural cycles. He also had experience with a lot of the Aboriginal tribes that are in Australia, and he remarked and marveled at how different their form of managing the landscape was different than the typical Western agricultural model. And of course, the Aborigines had been doing this for thousands of years, so they must be doing something, right? In 1974, he teamed up with his student, Mr. David Holgram, and they started the creating the seminal document there in the middle, the Permaculture Designer's Manual. Uh, that's kind of the, the beginning uh, critical book for permaculture. It was followed up a few years later by Permaculture II. It's difficult to find hardbound copies of either of those books, but they do exist as PDFs, so I do recommend getting a copy. It's very interesting to read to kind of understand where this all began. In 1979, they both created the Permaculture Institute, and the first design course was actually taught in India. If you decide to go into permaculture, I highly recommend taking something called a permaculture design course. It's often referred to as a PDC. Generally, a 72-hour long training really gets you into the basics of permaculture, which will then open up, the hopefully for you, a great interest in the field and pursue it further. Then you will follow it up with a master's practicum, which is another series. It basically, this one is a little more dealt with, though, in terms of working with your own property. So we'll talk a little bit more about how the whole process plays out. But I did want to note that in the beginning, and you're going to learn, there's lots of techniques in permaculture, different methods, different ways of doing things, and uh, you know, sort of very mechanistic, but you will, as time goes by, you'll start to realize that permaculture can pervade a lot of different aspects of your life. And while you may have a landscape and you have the opportunities to do upon that landscape, one of the things you are gonna also start appreciating and a lot of permaculture practitioners start realizing is they do have to have access, not just to land, but to finances, to information. And so, the way and that you go about acquiring those things can be a bit creative, and that's one of the joys of permaculture. So as I mentioned in the beginning, permaculture is to align your landscape management practices with natural processes. And you can hear a lot about ecology. So ecology is uh, comes from the Greek word oikos, and it means a house or a place to live. And it's the study of living things. It's also the study of organisms within their surroundings. And then the relationships between those living things. You're not just studying one living organism. You are studying the organism plus all the other things that make that organism able to exist. All of this occurs within an ecosystem. And an ecosystem is an area in which all living and non-living parts form an interacting system. So what this means is basically from the very basis from the water to the soils to the plants that grow to the animals that are able to survive within this system because of all of these things working together and the roles in which they play in it you have an ecosystem ecology is a very big field uh, many subdisciplines, but there are a few basic tenets that go along with any sort of study of ecology and one of those is that it is there is this dependence on energy flows. Energy makes the world go round, particularly in nature. And on our planet, much of our energy comes from the sun. Our system is very solar driven. And of course, solar energy drives everything from the geophysical to the geochemical cycles. And from all of that, life is able to exist on this planet. A couple things to remember about energy. And one of the goals within permaculture is the use of energy. 
So first, to begin with, energy used efficiency, efficiently creates a stable state. Mother Nature is really good at this. Um, you know, things uh, go along quite well without any perturbations, but the inefficient use results in instability. And that is where we as humans are kind of starting to find the predicament that we have made with our planet because we have interrupted some of those basic geophysical and geochemical cycles. And now we're starting to affect our climate and uh, it's going to have some serious consequences for us. One other fact is energy cannot be destroyed or created, but it can be transformed, stored, or wasted. And so permaculture is going to spend a lot of time in talking about different techniques on how to capture and store energy that's on your property and save that for use at a later date. We can also view permaculture as a way of living. And the way to do that is that permaculture encourages the restoration of balance to our environment. Well, what do I mean by balance? What evidence do I have of imbalance? I can walk out my house, I can see a perfectly green lawn, I can get in my car, I can drive through the countryside, and I'll see livestock grazing in the field, and I'll see row crops growing, and I'll see all the things that are necessary for my existence. But what I am missing is the time and the effort and the money that's necessary to maintain those lawns and those fields and those row crops. What we're trying to do with our typical Western agricultural system and our suburban lifestyle is to try to keep things in a steady state. And nature doesn't work that way. There's a constant process of change within nature. And the more that we fight against it, the more that we have to put forth in that fight. Permaculture is going to try to teach us ways and give us ideas and techniques that get us out of that pattern and put us on a much more sustainable way of, of managing our landscape. Permaculture provides a philosophy of cooperation with nature and each other. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna design spaces with diversity, stability, and the resilience of the natural ecosystems. I'm sure we're all familiar with the classic food web in which the primary producers, which are typically plants, are eaten by primary consumers, such as insects and small mammals which in turn are eaten by secondary consumers, which then are eaten by tertiary consumers, and then the process goes on and on. Things are born, they live, they die. One of the classic principles of ecology is called the diversity hypothesis. And what this says is the more different organisms there are within an ecosystem, the more roles and functions that are played by those organisms, say it be pollination, decomposition, the more bits that you have within that ecosystem, the more stability there is. And the way that this works is that if something should happen to one of those players, to one of those pieces, there's going to be a couple others who also perform that same function that can step in and take over that function. So then you have less disruption in your, in your ecosystem. So that's going to be one of the ideas that we're going to work with permaculture is making sure that we have a lot of different things going on, not just one, so that we're able to kind of weather any storms, diseases, any perturbations that can happen into our landscape. Permaculture is going to focus on design and it's going to be a conscious process of placement and planning of elements, objects, and processes in relationship to each other. One of the great things that I really enjoyed about permaculture is those in those early stages, you're recommended to take small steps. Take the time, take the effort to really learn what's going on within your property, know that, and then start thinking about what you want to do within it, but again, really having a good understanding of everything, all the bits and pieces of your property, and then really kind of thinking through and making sure that you make good, good sensible ideas, then you're gonna have much more success. Permaculture can be practiced across all landscape scales. Remember, the goal is to establish productive environments for food, energy, shelter, and other needs. You can do permaculture on the balcony of an apartment, or you can do it in the suburban lot to the largest farm. Permaculture is a way of living that encourages us to have some degree of self-reliance 
to the extent that, we're, that it's possible for us. And then finally, the really great thing about permaculture is that it synthesizes ecology and geography, observation and design. Permaculture is very holistic. This is not just landscape management. This is really looking at how we want to live our lives in the context in which we want to do it. And we bring all those things together, all of those ideas, we put them through the, I call it the permaculture cookbook, how can I achieve this? And then we end up with a landscape that provides us with things that we need, but in a much more satisfying way, because we know that not only are we trying to take care of ourselves, but we're trying to take care of Mother Earth. A really appealing part about permaculture that really drew me to it and that I was happy to know about is that there are some ethics and some design principles. For the ethics, earth care, people care, and fair share. The goal of permaculture is to bring ourselves and our landscape into alignment with natural processes. A lot of damage has been done to the earth. This is one way in our small way to help try to take care and to remediate some of that damage. On the same side of that, people care. We're trying to grow foods. We're trying to live. Humans have a need to live within a particular space. And so it is perfectly fine to realize that what you are doing is also for your benefit. Hopefully, if your system runs really well, you're going to have something left over. You're going to have a surplus. And what we need to do is share that surplus with others. So that's the fair share part. And fair share doesn't have to be, uh, I have some extra eggs or I got some extra tomatoes. It can also be, I have a skill set or I have a talent that I can share with my neighbor and both of us can then benefit from this. For the principles, number one, creatively use and respond to change. That's a biggie. Remember, there is no such thing as Stat, static, um, there is no belief in, a, in climax and natural systems. There is a constant change from birth to life to death. The system goes on and on. Nature is part of it, or this is part of a natural cycle. And so we have to accept it and make sure that we are adapting and we're going along with it. Number two, observe and interact. For your first year in permaculture, you're really not going to be doing too much in terms of actually any sort of techniques. You're going to spend this first year really getting to know your property. You're going to get out there in all times of year, all times of day, in all weather, and you're going to observe and what, know what's going on with your property. This is very important. Number three, catch and store energy. As we mentioned, um, it's very important. Energy comes and goes through your system all the time. The greater ability we have of taking advantage of that, knowing when it's there, catching some of it, saving it for another day, or optimizing what is there at that moment, then the more successful and the less energy dependent we are going to be upon what we're trying to do in terms of the techniques we're going to be putting in. Number four, obtain a yield. Permaculture is about using our landscape to produce things that we need. This is not a selfish way to look at it. This is a fact that we are also part of an ecosystem. We need to live, we need a place to live, and we need our landscape to provide us with those things. Actually, the more better that we manage our landscape and the more that we move away from the typical either suburban gardening ideal or the rest and agricultural ideal, the better we are actually able to obtain a yield and not feel guilty about it. Number five, apply self-regulation and accept feedback. What this means is, and again, getting back to the slow and steady idea is Take a look at your property, do some sort of permaculture technique that you're going to learn. You're going to learn about some more of those here in a bit and then watch what happens. Did it work? Yes. Did it not work? Why? Tweak it, understand it, and then try something new, try something different. Perhaps something that you tried was in the wrong place or 
you didn't account for certain exterior energies or other things that were going on, adapt and change it. Number six, use and value renewable resources and services. Just like Mother Nature, who does not need a bag of fertilizer to make the forest grow, the natural processes going across our landscape sometimes are obvious and sometimes they aren't. How many of us are mowing our grass and uh, picking up our clippings? How many people are raking the leaves and then putting them out to the curbside to go away. Why are we doing this? We are losing perfectly good natural resources that occurred on that spot. They're meant to be there and they're also meant to be returned to that spot or they're also meant to be converted and used in other spaces. But do not be wasting things that your landscape are giving you. Number seven, produce no waste. So this kind of gets back to number six is picking up sticks in your yard and you might see that as a waste of time and a burden but now you have all of this woody material and you're going to learn some techniques in which you can actually use that woody material so try to view the uh, detritus that your landscape provides you not so much as something as a burden that needs to be dealt with and thrown away but try to think of it as how can you apply it and use it in other places across your landscape or which it can be a benefit number eight design from pattern to details this is really a big one pattern is necessary pattern is the building block of nature pattern goes against chaos and so try to look at nature everything from galaxies to the spiral of a snail's shell, there is a pattern there. And so um, they abound in nature. And as I said, they are the uh, patterns are the foundation for creation to build upon. And so really try to think about and observe patterns within your own property. Number nine, integrate rather than segregate. So much of permaculture, as with life, has to do with relationships. And the better we understand those relationships, the better we are able to create a landscape in which plants are cooperating and providing ecosystems to each other, then the better able we are to recreate those relationships within our property. Uh, later, we're going to be discussing some concepts of the food forest and agroecology. But this notion of integrate rather than segregate is to get you to think about all the parts and how to make them work together as a whole. Number 10 use small and slow solutions. We are not going for the quick fix. Nature is complex and our ability to figure out what is going on and how to relate to it will take time. We're all working a lot of the small parts and we're trying to get them all to function together. So the emphasis is going to work smarter, not harder. So don't go nuts tearing up your whole yard and planting everything at once. Relationships are at the core of permaculture. Sometimes the things you place in your garden need time to affect the space before you plant the next thing. 11, use and value diversity. Remember we talked about the diversity hypothesis that I mentioned earlier? By bringing diversity into our gardens, we're reducing risk. Uh, oftentimes diseases and pests are very species specific. By having many, but so by having variety um, again, we kind of, we sort of offset the chance that one particular pest or one particular disease is going to come in and affect everything. Sure, it will take out that one thing, but then there will be other things within that ecosystem that are going to then fill in that void from the loss of that one particular plant or species that we have um, that's been affected. And number 12, use and value the marginal make use of all possible space. Straight rows are the result of industrial agriculture, but nature doesn't do straight lines. And there are a number of small garden designs that make use of curves. And it's also just more visually appealing. Permaculture is a creative act. As in most gardening, all of us that garden are in it for a particular reason. We have a vision of what we want our landscape to look like. And just like any other sort of creative act, be it a painting or a sculpture, this occurs within a particular space. And when within that particular space, there are 
um, confines. There are things that have to be accepted and dealt with in order for that vision to be successful. For instance, on our property, there are going to be soils. It's important to know what types of soils. Uh, you can find out what kind of soils you like from your county soil report, but the really important information within a soils report is what's the pH of my soil? What is the, how deep is the bedrock? Is it suitable for growing certain crops or certain things? So having a really good understanding of soil is really necessary. Water, particularly here where we live in the sort of the, the northeastern edge of the, of the country or in the middle of the, uh, the southern, well, pretty much the whole eastern seaboard, uh, we have a fairly temperate climate. There is a reasonable amount of water that comes to our property in different quantities throughout the year. But what's really, really important is where is that water? Where is that water collecting? Is it leaving one space quickly and pooling in another? It's important to know that. Weather, when and to what effect? Where does the north wind blow during the winter time? What is the dominant um, dominant wind throughout the winter time? What are some of the effects uh, the ice? Is there ice in certain areas and does certain areas within the landscape warm up sooner than others? So it's really important to know those about your own landscape. Existing structures. There are probably, there is, should be a home or a shed or a barn or various structures and things within your property. So understanding, are they having any effect? Do I have a southern facing wall which traps heat in the wintertime or reflects light? Are there shady areas, uh, north facing places that are cooler and wetter most of the time of the year? Really kind of knowing what's going on in those spaces then helps you make sure that you're putting the appropriate plant or the appropriate technique in that space. And then finally, we get down to the media. What plants, what techniques, what structures are we going to do? By having a better understanding of the palette, of the things that are on your nature, that are on your property, that are inherent to it, then the wiser, smarter selections we'll make when it does come to using the plants and the techniques and the structures that we're going to learn about. Permaculture is a landscape design practice. The goal is to create a yield. The goal is to use our landscape to provide us with things we need. And Mr. Mollison liked to say, the world is a sequence of events within a pattern. And we see that as well in terms of the seasons, lunar cycles, solar cycles, things that happen, we know they're going to happen. That's the great thing about seasons. With some degree of regularity, we know we're coming. They may differ in their intensities throughout the year, from year to year. But still, there is some reasonable product, uh, predictability within that. Uh, there are landforms. Landforms have patterns. Uh, steep, rocky crags, rolling hills. Knowing the landform on your property and those that surround you help you understand some of the energies that are coming into your property. Growth habits and sequences, again, very predictable. Most plants of one species all grow the same. So knowing their life cycle, knowing their lifestyle, knowing their conditions helps us to make sure that we're providing them the conditions they need. Behavior, migration, reproduction, hibernation for all living things. Every one of them experiences to some degree. So understanding the predictability and the occurrence and when these are happening is really important. As I said, there are patterns, they're all around us, and sometimes they're easily recognized, sometimes they're completely hidden, but that first year of your Palmer culture practice is going to be spending time trying to uncover these patterns within your own landscape. And we'll just kind of wrap it up with an understanding of the basic underlying patterns of natural phenomena is an essential tool for design and harmonious living. So let's get back to the idea of the sort of permaculture as a landscape design methodology. And now we're going to kind of get to the nuts and bolts of it. First year, going to spend it in assessment. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And this is uh, my recommendation. Get out a piece of paper. Do a rough sketch of your property, place, buildings, 
orient it to the cardinal directions, sketch in groups of plantings, other important features of your property. And then that's going to be the template for your data collection because you're going to be out in your property and throughout the year, throughout the seasons, different days, different times, and you're going to be making observations and you're going to need a place to keep that information and you're going to transfer all of that to this big map that you're making of your property. There's going to be some record keeping going on. Where's the water? Where's the wind? Where's the sun throughout different times of the year? So you will need to be able to track that. And really one of the great things about this is you're going to actually get a chance to really look and observe and perceive your property. And this is important because a greater understanding of your property, that deeper connection that you're going to have with it is actually going to be rather rewarding. And, and you're going to start feeling a little different about how you want to manage it and how important it is to you. In the meantime, you're going to be creating a vision plan. And this is the fun part. This is the pie in the sky. This is your the thing you saw in the magazine, or uh, you know that little that fun little structure you saw in Downton Abbey, or you went and saw this uh, really impressive garden. Oh, I want that koi pond. This is fun. This is the time to really kind of bring those things together and be thinking about them. Because what you also need to be thinking about is, are they possible? Do I have the time? Do I have the budget? and where should they go. Next, and slowly as all of you start getting all this information together, toward the end of that first year, you're going to start working on your concept plan. And this is the general map of what goes where. You've taken the time and the effort. You know what's going on with your property. You have the things from your vision plan that you want to do on your property. And now you start understanding and really kind of thinking about, yeah, that's that's a good place for a koi pond. That is a good place for an orchard. That makes sense to have this particular plant species down in that wet area because that wet area is what that plant species likes. You're going to make better decisions rather than trying to force your visions upon a place that they don't belong. So having the information and the insight from doing that assessment along with the thing that you really want, knowing how those two work together, then you start putting those into your concept plan. And then finally, the action plan. I recommend a five-year plan. I'm going to go back to the idea, slow and steady, small and simple. Figure out a few things, try them. Some things, remember, some techniques actually will transform a space, but it might need time to do that. Certain plants can transform a space, but they need to be allowed to do that before you then put something in next to them. This is really critical. Do not go crazy, tear up your landscape, and try to do everything at once because you are then going against the very principles of permaculture, which are to lessen the labor and the time and the effort that you have to put into managing your landscape. Here's a good example of a, an assessment. There is a, a very simple sketch of a property and they've highlighted, they've oriented it to a certain direction and they've put in the house and any sort of salient features, certain obvious things that if you were to walk into that property, these would be things that you would see. And so this is really important to do because it helps you look at your landscape from a, a bird's eye view and also, perhaps you have a hedge and you've never really thought about the effect that that hedge has on your property. Is it blocking sunlight? Is there shade that's provided by this at certain times of the day that you never really observed or understood before? These are really important things to get down on your property and really take the time to look at them, observe them throughout the year and understand the effect that they're having on them. I mean, we all have spots probably during the height of the summer where we go to get out of the heat, we go to a shady spot. We always know that that shady spot is there and we always retreat to it, but we've never really thought about what is also growing there because of that continuous shade. So really having an understanding is going to help you as you move forward. 
Some of the things that are important, contours. You can get um, contours. This is basically the shape of your land, the slope of your land from the high point to the low point. You're, you can get that from uh, any number of sources, um, Google Earth. Your county probably has an online county uh, GIS. Again, a great place to try to, uh, that you can get contours of your property. Again, the soil types, really knowing what kind of soils you have on there. Don't try to make your soil into something it won't be, or you can improve soil through composting, but that's something that we will delve into a little bit later. And then are there any distinguishing features? Are there certain groups of plants, big groups of plants that are obviously exerting a, a certain degree of influence on a, on a property. Um, maple trees. Maple trees are wonderful, big, beautiful shade trees, but they also suck up all the moisture. They drop the little babies everywhere and they pretty much outcompete anything growing under them. So look at the plants that are growing there and understand the influence that they're having so that when you think about the next technique that you want to do, you're making sure that you're not working against that situation, but actually working with it. Some of the data collection is really important. Air and water flow. Where does the north wind blow? And um, how, you know, cold winds oftentimes around here rise out of the north and the west, uh, here in Virginia anyway. So knowing that during the winter time, what should, what can take that kind of wind? Should it bear the full brunt of it? Landforms direct in terms of water flow. Where is the water flowing when it hits my property? Am I shoving my water off through gutter downspouts into particular areas or can I? Can I trap that water as it leaves my house and concentrate it and direct it to a particular area? Think about those, um, those factors. Individual plants and communities of plants. Again, we sort of talked about the maple tree and the hedgerow and the influence they're having on our property. Really make sure you have an understanding of that. And then finally, are there any patterns? Oftentimes in a typical landscape design, patterns emerge based upon the aesthetic that the designer had or that we have. So see if those patterns are emerging within your property and be aware of them. One of the really big principles of permaculture is this idea of zones. So this is where we're gonna take our vision plan what do I want? And this is kind of be of our wish list. And oh, I want an herb garden and I want a vegetable garden and I want chickens and bees and I want an orchard. Well, zones on the landscape are where we take those elements that we want in our vision plan. And then we think about how often we are actually going to engage or that we are actually going to need to be manipulating or managing that particular thing that we want and then the time and the distance that it required. So one way to think about this is um, I kind of call it, I, I'm making a pot of soup. So I'm in zone zero, uh, I'm in my home, I have a pot of soup simmering on the stove and I realize that I need some herbs and some vegetables for it. The logical place is that I step out my back door and I go to zone one. There, the thing that I need is readily accessible. I can run out there, I can snip my herb, I can grab my vegetable, I can run back in and not burn my house down by having a simmering pot of food and I have to go a great distance from it. You want the things that you engage with on a daily basis closest to your house. That lessens the time and the effort and the distance necessary in order to access that thing. So oftentimes you will see herb gardens and vegetable gardens very close to the, to the house. Those are something that you need pretty much on a daily basis. In zone two, then we start getting to things like, um, it's a good place to put our chicken coop. We don't necessarily have to engage with the chickens every day, but um, you know we want eggs, so typically you gather eggs every other day. So it's not so far as to walk out to zone two, and that's a good place to put the things that you need on a that you're going to visit several times throughout the week. Zone three is the next. That is a, a greater distance from the home because of the need to engage with it great place to put an orchard. Um, orchards, berry bushes, those sort of things 
typically only have like one month of, of interest. Your fruit comes one month a year, same with berries. So there isn't that need to have them so close to the house. Have them use that space farther away from your house. Have the more intensive uses closer to the house, the less intensive uses farther away from the house. And that also then bases the level of engagement that you're going to have with those areas. Zone four, this is your wood lot. This is the place that you have your firewood, that you put things that you might need, might not need, but they don't need to be so close and take up valuable space, valuable productive space. Stick those things out there further away. And finally, zone five, give some space for wildlife. You have your little piece of paradise that mother nature have the rest. Now, remember, and it's not unreasonable to have wildlife and things within our property because they do provide a benefit. A lot of birds are very effective at helping us with our pest control. So you do want that space within your property, but at the same time, give them their own space in which to live their own lives. We're also going to be talking about sectors. Sectors is a way to think about energy. Energy is constantly moving through our property and we need to know where it's coming from, where it's going, where it's staying, where it's not. If you're on a slope, use gravity, water flows downhill, have something along the way to catch it. Orientation, sun or shade. I guarantee I could ask you, where does the sun shine on your property? And you would be able to tell me, but that changes throughout the year. From spring to summer, the sun does not always arise directly due east. It shifts back and forth across that eastern axis. And it also sets in a different axis to the west. And also, it's at higher elevations during particular times of year than it is in others. So really having an understanding where the sun is at any time during the year on your property helps the proper placement of the different plants and different things that you want to do. And then finally, you pull it all together and you might end up with that looks like this. Here's another idea. Here's talks more about zones. You kind of get the idea uh, a little clearer with this image. Zone one um, around the house. Typically, the house is zone zero and then around it is zone one. But this is the same idea. Things that you need every day and the herbs, the vegetable gardens. Then you work your way out between zones one and two is a great place to put your chicken coop. You have the things, you do have to take care of your chickens on a daily basis to and every other day you do need to get the eggs. So have them not too far away. Zone three, great place to put the, the bees and the goats and the chicken run. Get them a little away from the house just for various reasons, but they don't need to be occupying valuable space in which you're growing your vegetables and your berries and your fruits. Zone four, between zone three and four is a great place to put the orchard. Again, because of the level of engagement that you're gonna have them in a limited time throughout the year, they don't need to be taking up valuable space. So stick them out there and the, a little bit further away. And then finally, zone five, give some space for wildlife. Let's go a little bit more into the whole idea of sector and the notion of where weather is affecting our property, where these energies are arising from. And remember, we don't have to be a passive participant in how this energy works. We can direct energy. We can block energy. We can manipulate energy. We can store energy. If the north wind really affects a piece of your property and to a negative, you can plant a hedge. You can buffer that energy. If the sun shines, if you need the sun to shine in a particular area but it's continually shaded, you can do some selective pruning to open that space up. Or if you need shade, you can plant things that will shade a particular area. There are ways to manipulate the energy that's on our property, but we need to know first where they are and how they're working. And that kind of gets to the idea of then of identifying microhabitats. Uh, microhabitats are um, areas of concentrated energy within our property. So we pull all this together. This is all the information that we're gathering: the zones, the sectors, slope, orientation, 
Once we know all that, then we start thinking about the species of plants that we want to grow. By understanding their requirements and by understanding our property, we have a better chance of really putting the right thing in the right place. Okay, let's start getting into some of the really basic ideas of permaculture uh, as, a, as a landscape methodology. One of the words you're going to hear a lot is polyculture. Many of us are familiar probably with the idea of the three sisters, where you plant corn, squash, and beans together in terms of um, the benefit that each provides to the other. The corn provides a stable structure for the bean to grow up. The bean, because it's a legume, produces nitrogen in its roots. It's a nitrogen fixer. And then the squash sprawls throughout and its large sheet, uh, leaves provide shade and shelter and moisture. So all of these three things work together for the mutual benefit of each. So you see a lot of this idea in, in permaculture. It dispenses with this idea of straight rows of one plant or um, just kind of that traditional Western notion of order and uniformity within a particular garden. It, some might call it messy, but the idea is that we're planting plants together. It's a whole notion of relationships where we're planting things together in order for them to benefit one another. It gets back to the whole idea of diversity. Remember, the more things that we have in, our pro in a landscape that serve a particular function, if we were to lose one of those, then we have others that can fill in that gap. And that's really vital. Another word you'll hear is guilds. This is often done with orchards, uh, a fruit tree guilds, food forest. The big idea behind that is that each plant is playing a particular role. So oftentimes the successful guild, we call these guilds, just like um, for the human term, a guild is a group of similar of people that perform a similar function. So we're going to have, so have the same idea within our food forest. So the first supporter is going to be the nitrogen fixer. The nitrogen fixer is that plant that is able to fix nitrogen. Nitrogen is a limited nutrient in our in our soils and this there's certain plants particularly the bean plants the leguminaceous plants are able to take nitrogen out of the soil and convert it into a usable form that can be uptaken by a plant and this is really important for soil health second is the the living mulches and the living mulches are plants that aren't necessarily something that we're going to eat but they just by the very fact of the the size of the leaf that they grow that they are able to sh shield the soil from drying the sun drying out from the sun uh, a great example are pumpkin plants or squash plants that have these very large leaves that shade the soil so you can have a very large plant with very few fruits but those leaves do an amazing job of shielding the, the ground, keeping it from drying out and combating, combating against weeds and providing a, a stable soil moisture while they're growing. Number three, the nutrient catchers. Some plants put down really deep tap roots and they really get down to those stores of minerals deep down in the soil and they can bring them up to the surface and make those nutrients and minerals available to the plants on the surface. Think things like dandelion or burdock or um, comfrey, some of those plants that really put down a really deep root that we don't necessarily eat, but they do provide um, a way to access those minerals. And number four, the supporters are the, the insect attractors. You do need bugs in your, in your garden. You need pollination. Many bugs provide provide a, a benefit. They aid in composition, or as I like to say, assassination. 
There are a lot of very beneficial insects out there that can help you with your pest problems, but you need to provide them the things that they need for their life. So making sure that you have an understanding of certain life requirements for some of the beneficial insects and then providing them with those plants that they can lay their eggs upon, that they can rear the young, those are really important to make sure that you work into your food forest. All right, let's get down to some of the really basic sort of fun techniques. And uh, my first one is Hugel culture from the very romantic German language. And in German, it means mound. And it's exactly that. The idea, and this is where we get back to the notion of using, understanding and using available resources, as you walk around and you pick up the sticks and all the detritus of your yard, and you bag it up and you throw it away, this is a chance to actually use that material for a much better use. So in Hugo culture, it begins with uh, sort of the branches. So you're, you're pruning things, you have this woody debris, and you basically pile it up in a, in a row, kind of in a pile. You can trench it out and put it in the hole if you like, or you can just lay it down, make sort of a, a, rec a long, run of it and then you're going to cover it with compostable materials so your your green prunings your grass clippings and sod and straw all sort of the the typical more herbaceous detritus from your yard you're going to pile that on top of the wood then you're going to cover all of that with a thin layer of compost over the pile then it's necessary to put the compost down because the material underneath has to break down and in the process of breaking down it's going to use up available nitrogen so by giving it the compost you're going to supply it with a ready source of nitrogen to help kind of pro speed up that decomposition process and then finally you're going to cover that with a layer of soil about an inch thick and essentially that surface then you're, you are going to have a mound as you can see over on the right there under for the polyculture you're going to have a mound of dirt underneath it is going to be this woody material that's going to break down slowly over time it's going to retain moisture on top of that is going to be other material that's also going to be breaking down at a faster rate then you're going to have the compost that's going to be balancing out the nitrogen between the things that you're going to plant on top along with the nitrogen process is going on below and then so you're going to have this self-sustaining system that as time goes it's going to slowly break down and be providing this wonderful plantable area for a long time on the right is an example of a polyculture on top of a hugo culture mound again notice it does depart from that typical aesthetic it can look messy but you can see there are sunflowers and there are beans and there are squashes and there's all these different plants that are thriving within that area because they are they're a they're being provided with they're planted on an area that's providing them with everything they need moisture rich soils and then they are also benefiting each other in the shading and the mulch and the nitrogen fixing and everything that's going on by having this diverse ecosystem It's very important. Um, a lot of water can fall in one inch. A one inch rainstorm can prevent, present an, a tremendous amount of water, but we need to be able to ways to catch it. On the left there is a rain barrel. This is a bit of a departure from sort of the messier rain barrel styles that have existed. You actually can buy this uh, particular um, system at, I believe, Lowe's and it's wonderful it has a gutter diverter puts it into the tank no open breeding grounds for mosquitoes a very nice efficient clean system rather attractive another landscape feature are swales and this is where it's important to if, particularly if you have sleep, steep slopes on your property is another way to trap water as it moves across the property so the idea is that a trench is built perpendicular to the slope and as water flows down that trench, well, first, and this is, I really like this particular example because this is where they've used Hugo culture. So they've laid down the woody debris in sort of a linear fashion. 
They've trenched the soil, they've turned that soil, they've flipped it over on top of the hugelkultur, on top of the wood, and then just downslope of that, they've planted the various perennials, food plants, vegetables that they want to grow in that space. And then so as water moves down the hillside, it gets trapped in that soil. The water resides there. It moves laterally through the soil. It encounters that woody debris. It helps the decomposition. And then the roots of all the perennial plants that you've planted in there, the vegetables have their roots in that area. And now that water is trapped there. It's sort of like sponge and a very highly effective system and a very popular system in permaculture. Composting. It is amazing how much food waste this country is capable of. Even a family of four, it is pretty astounding, as try as hard as we may, that there is just a lot of food scraps that would typically go in the trash, but wholly unnecessary, and it is very important to explore different composting systems. There's any number of different ideas out there. So I suggest that you figure out what works well for your property, but by all means, really get into composting because it is a, a wonderful free resource. Remember, produce no waste. So don't be throwing away something that can turn into a very valuable resource for your property. Sheet mulching is a technique for improving soils, depending on what kind of soil you have. Uh, the, the traditional, no, it, particularly if you had bad soils, one of the traditional methods was to do something called um, double digging. And that would basically sh shovel full after shovel full of soil would be dug, flipped, turned upside down. And this was a very back-breaking, tedious method, depending on, I, I mean, some people still like to do it. I, I kind of get it once in a while when I know I'm trying to improve the structure of the soil. But sometimes it's just not necessary. And you can achieve the same thing. This is really particularly effective if you have a grassy expanse of lawn. It can be very hard to get rid of grass. Uh, you don't want to spray anything to kill it off. So the technique is to basically just leave the earth there. On top of it, put some, um, you, you can cut the grass, leave the cut grass, and then on top of it, you can put uh, about an inch of manure, and then a layer of cardboard. On top of the cardboard, you're gonna stack some straw or hay, um, and then on top of that, another inch or two of compost, and then on top of that, some straw, leaves, or other kind of mulch. Some people call this a mulch sandwich. And give it a year, heck, six months, if it breaks down rather quickly. And you'll be amazed that how that soil underneath, where the grass has, of course, been killed off, and all of that material is now ready to be planted in. Uh, a nice way to save your back, no double digging, and really achieving a, a good plantable area. Okay, there are so many different permaculture techniques, so by all means, sign up for your PDC. Those trainings go on across the country. I really recommend looking into them. They're really a great way to learn firsthand from the practitioners. You'll get to go see these things in action and it's really a, a, a wonderful new gardening journey. Permaculture has grown. It's, uh, it's being seen as a way to address a lot of the problems that we have with the planet, with the loss of biodiversity, with the problems of the typical Western agricultural complex. And you're starting to see agroforestry, agroecology be a counterpoint to the industrial agricultural complex we're realizing, particularly in developing countries where we're trying to preserve the biodiversity, that this is a great way to help people achieve a level of self-reliance uh, by getting them, but getting them away from this reliance upon chemical inputs that can be very expensive, particularly for the poor farmers. And it, but by preventing monocultures, we cut down on the deforestation we provide a way for people to live 
much more in sync with their surroundings to provide them with the things that they want, but to do it in an economically sound way. So you do see the scaling up of permaculture. Uh, it's a much more localized approach. You're seeing groups like the Nature Conservancy really kind of take this approach. They, of course, are focused on biodiversity conservation, but they're realizing that in order to do that, they have to work with the local people, understand their methods, and help them get access to the resources in order to do it much more effectively. And uh, again, a couple groups that are doing this, uh, La Via Campesina, working out of Central South America, a wonderful group, and the Nature Conservancy. So really kind of look into some of their work that they're doing as part of this more global approach to permaculture. Permaculture is a sustainability movement. Um, please get bees, uh, solitary bees and honeybees. You do need these pollinators. Uh, and just the very fact that studying them and having them is an amazing uh, journey. Um, I, I'm, I have honeybees and I just marvel at how incredibly complex and how beautiful these creatures are. So find a way to work them into your, into your landscape. And lastly, permaculture is a social movement. It gets back to that idea of fair share. We are humans. And the only way that we're going to get through all this is if we get through it together. So produce a yield, have your property, give you the things that you need, be less reliant upon the, 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 the stores and the things, pr pr bring some self-reliance into your property. Uh, right now we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there is, if at any point in our history, we are really we are seeing food shortages, so this is a great time to make our food system more localized and provide more for ourselves. Also, let's remember principle number 19: integration rather than segregation. Let's all start working together. One way to do that is to work with our neighbors to work with our local food suppliers, our local growers. And what, let's do that through seed libraries. If I have too much of one seed, let's exchange it with somebody else who has another kind. I've got lots of squash, you've got lots of tomato. Let's share our seeds and grow something of benefit to each of us. Community food forests are very important, particularly in our urban areas where there is this food desert where people don't have access to good healthy food. Let's find land that we can grow food for them so that they have an equal access to healthy nutritious food. CSAs, another way to support the local farmer. Volunteer days, give some time, give some help, particularly in those food for, in those urban um, community food forests. Uh, just a little bit will go a long way. Remember, it isn't all about necessarily about trading food. We also have skills and other things that we can trade and barter. I might be a good electrician. You might be a good carpenter. Let's come together and build something beautiful. And then finally, let's teach our children about abundance. Let's teach them how to grow food. Let's teach them some self-reliance. Let's return to them that marvel of just how amazing nature is and how that we are a part of it rather than something separate. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on lawns and gardens, contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk. Thank you for watching.